Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. You know, by now, you've probably heard the phrase toxic fandom that's bandied about by snowflakes, SJWs, as if bitching about various aspects of science fiction is somehow new or even bad. In fact, it is anything but. In fact, bitching is the birthright of every science fiction fan and has been since fandom became organized in the 1930s. So to explain this is going to require a bit of a history lesson, so sit back, relax, and let the Fandai Master tell you about things in fanish history that you may not know. However, knowing these things is key to becoming a Fandai Master yourself. Remember that Fandai Masters have watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction, and fanish history is simply part of that. The famous and pioneering Hugo Gernsback had been publishing various science fiction ba based magazines in the 1930s. And New York City, David Lasser, Gernsback managing editor, nurtured the uh, birth of a small club, a local one in New York, called the Scienceers, which held its first meeting in a Harlem apartment on December 11th, 1929. And almost all of the members were adolescent boys. Around this time, a few other small local groups began to pop up in metropolitan areas around the United States, many of them connecting via, uh, with other enthusiasts via a very early club called the Science Correspondence Club. And you can imagine they operated mostly with mail. Now, the first fanzines occurred in the 1930s. In May 1930, the very first science fiction fan magazine, The Comet, was produced by the Chicago branch of the Science Fiction Correspondence Club. Editor was Raymond A. Palmer, who was later a uh, writer, um, a notorious, somewhat notorious science fiction magazine editor, and Walter Dennis. In January of 1932, the New York City Circle, which by then included future comic book editor Julia Schwartz and Mort Weisinger, brought out the first issue of their own publication, The Time Traveler, with Forrest J. Ackerman, the famous Forey Ackerman, as the embryonic Los Angeles group as the contributing editor. If you do not know who Forey Ackerman is, who Forrest J. Ackerman is, look him up. One of my friends was lucky enough to visit the Acker Mansion, which was filled to overflowing with great science fiction memorabilia for over about a century at that point. But he has sadly passed away. I would love to have seen the Acker Mansion. Then we have the Science Fiction League, and this was founded by Hugo, Hugo Gernsback in February of 1934. Now you have to remember the most prestigious award in science fiction, the Hugo Award, is named for Hugo Gernsback for his pioneering work. Now, Hugo uh, Gernsback had uh, published, um, he wanted to promote this in Wonder Stories, which was an early science fiction pulp magazine that he ran. And uh, Wonder Stories ran from about 1929 to 1955, and it had a circulation of about 10,000, tw sorry, 20,000 in 1984. So Gernsback, um, he was the league's first executive secretary with uh, Char Charles D. Hornig as the assistant secretary. The initial slate of executive directors included Forrest J. Ackerman, Ando Binder, Jack Darrow, Edmund Hamilton, David H. Keller, P. Schuyler Miller, Clark Ashton Smith, and R. F. Starzl. These are all some famous names that if you looked up, you could Google them and find out some very interesting works that they've done. Gernsback had intended for his magazine Wonder Stories to promote fandom, much like his earlier Radio League had been promoted um, by his early radio and electronic hobby magazines. Gernsback was very much a pioneer when it came to magazines in the 1920s and 30s that we might take for granted today. It was successful, his efforts, and chapters were then formed both in the U.S., U.K., and Australia. The Los Angeles Science Fiction so uh, Society was founded at this time with a local branch as a local branch of the Science Fiction League. Although League membership was popular, with membership soon reaching about 1,000, it didn't last very long. In 1943, Sam Merwin, the editor of Thrilling Wonder Stories, because Wonder Stories had changed its name since then, um, stopped uh, doing the organizational efforts and uh, when he took over the editorship. 
Now, science fiction legend Fre Frederick Paul recalled that the league changed a lot of lives. It filled a need by helping fans meet each other, and he also reported that some chapters of the science fiction league still existed um, for 20 or 30 years afterwards. Now, then there was the Greater New York Science Fiction Club, and this was headed by Sam Moskowitz, later an in a very influential science fiction editor and a historian. The history of this group is largely lost to time. Uh, I think there's some works that Moskowitz has done himself, um, but mostly it's lost to time. It is notable for something that's about to come up in a minute. Then there was Philadelphia and the very first science fiction convention. In 1935, the Philadelphia Science Fiction Society was formed, and it exists today. The very next year, half a dozen fans from New York City came to meet with the Philadelphia uh, members and the first Philadelphia Science Fiction Conference, the world's first science fiction convention, was held. And then there was the New York Futurians Society, or just the Futurians for short. This was founded by Donald A. Walheim in September of 1938, and it was active until 1945. The leaders were Walheim and John B. Michael. Keep that man name in mind. Michael was a member of the Young Communist League and advocated communism to the rest of the group. The Futurians had broken off from the Greater New York Science Fiction Club over ideological differences. Walheim wanted science fiction to take a more overtly Marxist political stance. And other sources also indicated that Walheim was pushing a very far left wing um, uh, direction for with a goal of leading a fandom toward a political ideal. And all of this was resisted by Sam Moskowitz of the Greater New York Science Fiction Club. So they split. And then after the split, the Greater New York Science Fiction Club really could no longer call itself that, so it became the Queen's Science Fiction Club. Now, members of the Futurians, this is very important, were people who went on to become authors and also editors. So, for example, members of the Futurians include Isaac Asimov, the guy who was, during his lifetime, one of the most prolific science fiction authors and regular authors in general ever, period, end of story. Huge, huge impact on science fiction. James Blish, who wrote a lot of his own stuff, but is probably at this point also remembered for having novelized all of the Star Trek, the original series episodes. Virginia Kidd, who went on to marry James Blish, Damon Knight, Cyril Kornbluth, Robert W. Laundes, Judith Merrill, John B. Michael, Frederick Paul, Richard Wilson, and Donald Walheim himself, who was the founder of Daw Books which is a publisher or was a publisher of science fiction. All of those names are very well-known science fiction authors. If you do not know them, well, go look them up. A lot of their work is on Project Gutenberg and is for free. You can read it yourself. They are great, great, great. The club dissolved after Donald A. Walheim sued several other members of the club for libel because they'd angrily distributed a document they ejected him from the club because they thought that he had forced member John Michael to end an affair with member Judith Merrill. Walheim later said that he had no idea and thought that it was Michael's idea to break up with Merrill. The group, however, was heavily influential in literary science fiction as evidenced, again, by the large number of members who went on to become distinguished authors and uh, editors. Now, the group um, was in large part responsible for the uh, politically liberal sensibilities that tend to dominate science fiction to this very day. And then there was the Science League of America. The Science League of America was a different organization from the Science League, Science Fiction League, rather. Uh, sorry, this is Science, Fic Science Fiction League of America, and that was a different one from the Science Fiction League of America that I just mentioned. You have to get the America different. Um, it was a different organization. It generally inclu included writers, among them Ted Sturgeon, another guy who has done a lot of work, um, Anthony Boucher, and, of course, the incredibly prolific Isaac Asimov. And this uh, also was associated with the television show Tales of Tomorrow, which ran from about 1951 to 1953. That's all the people who were involved in that sort of thing, starting it up and going in as professionals. However, there were fanzines, a lot of fanzines. Because in the 1930s, fans started to communicate each other with uh, the creation of science fiction fanzines. They were called fanzines because they were like magazines created by science fiction fans. Um, 
These fanzine publications might or might not, might not discuss science fiction and were generally traded rather than sold. They ran the gamut from utilitarian and uh, inept to professional quality printing and editing. In the internet age, first Usenet news groups um, supplanted printed uh, fanzines, and today, of course, websites, social media, very much so Facebook, and blogs have totally supplanted fr printed fanzines as an outlet for expression and fandom, although some popular fanzines continue to be published. Science fiction fans have been among, in fact, the very first users of computers in general, email, personal computers, and the internet. Many professional science fiction authors uh, started their interest in science fiction as fans and still some publish their own fanzine or contribute to fanzines published by others. And of course we have conventions. I mentioned the precise um, you know, time and place of the very first science fiction convention is in fact a matter of some dispute. Sometime in 1936, a group of British fans made plans to have an organized meeting with a planned program of events in a public venue. Um, they were planning that for 1937. However, on October 22nd, 1936, a group of six or seven fans from New York City, which included uh, David Kyle and Frederick Pohl, uh, traveled by train to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where <laughs> for several hours they visited a similar number of local fans in the house of Milton A. Rothman, and they subsequently declared that event to be the very first science fiction convention. Now, this small gathering actually set the stage for a follow-up event held in New York in February of 1937, where there were 30 or 40 fans gathered at the Bohemian Hall in Astoria, Queens. And attendees at this event included James Blish, Charles D. Hornig, Julius Schwartz, and William Conover. This event became to be known as the Second Eastern and was set the stage again for the very successful Third Eastern held in Philadelphia on October 30th, 1937, and the subsequent Fourth Easter held on May 29th, 1938, which attracted over 100 attendees to uh, a meeting hall in New Newark, New Jersey, and designated itself the very first science fiction convention. It was at this event that a committee was named to arrange the very first World Science Fiction Convention in New York City in 1939. The first um, national, this one, was a milestone in the evolution of science fiction conventions as a place for science fiction professionals, as well as fans, to meet their colleagues in person. Didn't happen back then. So, on January 3rd, 1937, the British fans then held their long-planned event at the Theosophical Hall in Leeds, and around 20 fans, including Eric Frank Russell and Arthur C. Clarke, were in attendance. To this day, many fan historians, especially those in the United King Kingdom, contend that the Philadelphia meeting was, only, was a convention in name only, whereas other fan historians point out that many similar gatherings since then have been called conventions without eliciting any kind of disagreement. So, Worldcon. Worldcon is considered the premier science fiction convention up to today. But in 1939, a, uh, Americans uh, fans had organized uh, sufficiently to hold in conjunction with the 1939 World's Fair, the very first World Science Fiction Convention, which has later always been shorted to Worldcon in New York City. Subsequent World Cons were held in Chicago in 1940, Denver in 1941, and like many culture events, they were suspended during World War II. But they continued in 1946 with the hosting of World Con in Los Angeles, California. And the first World Con held outside the United States was in Toronto in 1948. Since then, World Cons have been held in Britain, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada, Australia, Japan, Finland, and uh, Ireland, although many uh, World Cons are still held in the United States. Now, one of these was really important. <laughs> The 24th Worldcon, which was Tricon, because you have to understand, Worldcon is not a convention all by itself. Worldcon is a name that is given over to some convention somewhere in the world, and it is called Worldcon. So Tricon um, was held September 1st through 5th, 19, September 1966, at uh, Sheraton Cleveland in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, United States. Officially, the convention was hosted by three cities in the region. Um, uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Detroit, hence the name Tricon. But it is notable 
because it was the convention, this one, that Gene Roddenberry premiered, the first two pilots for Star Trek, The Cage, and Where No Man Has Gone Before. And on the 1976 record album, Inside, oh, it's also a CD now, Inside Star Trek, Roddenberry related the following anecdote. I took the Star Trek pilots to Tricon in Cleveland, a science fiction convention. When the show began, when they, when they began showing my pilot, I noticed a gentleman standing, or rather I heard a gentleman standing nearby, beginning to talk as my show came on. And nervously, I hurried over to him and I said, for Christ's sakes, man, be quiet. They've got my pilot on. Someone then walked up to me and said, congratulations, you've just insulted Isaac Asimov. Asimov has said that he doesn't remember the incident specifically, but that it rings true because he was always talking. But Roddenberry further said, the point of it that I remember was that, uh, you know, about the, after the show, the, he came over, the man that I've always wanted to meet, my idol in science fiction, he came over, he apologized and said, you're quite right, I shouldn't have been talking. And then he said some nice things about the pilot, and it was the beginning of a very long friendship. And if you want to, um, you know, get a copy of Inside Star Trek and hear all of these anecdotes for yourself, I have a link to it in my description box. Since the first conventions in the late 1930s, such as Worldcon, hundreds of local and regional fiction, science fiction conventions have sprung up around the world, either as one-time or annual events. And at these conventions, if you're not familiar, which at this point, who isn't, fans of science fiction come together with uh, professional writers, artists, filmmakers to discuss various aspects of it. Some cities have a number of science fiction conventions as well as a number of special interest conventions for anime, media, or other related groups. Some conventions move from city to city serving a particular a region or country or special interest. But nearly every weekend of the year now hosts a science fiction convention somewhere with some conventions held on weekends uh, that are long weekends so that they can get four day holidays for the events. And of course, one of the most popular and uh, influential of modern conventions is San Diego Comic Con. Now, my own first convention was Rigel Four in 1975 in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I live today. It was produced by Starbase Andromeda, the local science fiction fan club. Starbase Andromeda was founded on February 7th, 1974 as Lincoln's citywide Star Trek club. But over the years, it has expanded to encompass a wide variety of fanish interests and pastimes. And it still meets today, and there is a link to it in my description box. Now, I first saw the movie Forbidden Planet at Rigel's uh, 4 in Lincoln here. I also saw what's called the studio edition of Star Trek's second pilot, Where No Man Has Gone Before. This is a version that was screened only for Desilu studio executives and NBC executives before the series was picked up, and it includes a few extras that were cut from the broadcast. After many years, many, many years, it finally became available on the Star Trek The Original Series Blu-ray set, and I suggest that you watch it. It's kind of an interesting difference. This convention, in fact, marked my entrance into Star Trek fandom. Up until that time, I'd been, you know, a fan with sort of bare understanding that fandom existed somewhere. But after Rigel 4, I was in it for life. I joined Starbase Andromeda immediately after attending R Rigel 4. In fact, I probably joined while I was there. From 1974 to 2003, Starbase Andromeda produced a newsletter, The Andromedan Log, which was then supplanted by its website. And from 1975 to 1982, Starbase Andromeda produced four issues of the fanzine, The Kelvin Outpost. Now this thing's publication history, which I was around for all of, was odd. <laughs> and the number of issues it produced is somewhat lost to history. It was very strange. Um, fandom in other nations, Sweden, for example, they organized uh, fandom in about uh, the early 1950s. And the first Swedish fanzine was started in the early 1950s as well. The oldest existing club is Club Cosmos in Gothenburg, and it was formed in 1954. The first Swedish science fiction convention, um, Lundcon, was held in Lund in 1956. Today, um, there are a number of science fiction clubs in the country, and between one and four science fiction uh, conventions are held each year in Sweden. Among them is SWICON, the national annual convention. Another annual prize is awarded to someone that has contributed to the national fandom by the Alvar Appeltoft Memorial Fund. <laughs> 
In the UK, science fiction fandom has very close ties to the United States, and there are multiple conventions. The largest regular convention for literary science fiction, that is something based on books mostly, is uh, the National Convention or Easter Con, and that of course occurs generally over the Easter weekend. The committee memberships and locations specifically change from year to year. Now there's a license to use the Easter Con name. It's kind of like um, World Con. It's not really a con in and of itself, but it's awarded by votes of the business meeting of the Easter Con um, of two years previously. There are uh, substantially larger events run by UK media fandom and commercial organizations also run Gate Shows, which is a for-profit uh, for operation with a paid staff. The UK uh, has hosted Worldcon several times, most recently in, in 2014. Uh, news of UK events appears in the fan scene Ansible, produced by David Langford each month. In Italy, the beginning of Italian science fiction fandom can be located between the late 1950s, early 1960s, when magazines such as Oltre il Cielo and Futuro started uh, publishing uh, readers' uh, letters and promote uh, correspondence and the setting up of clubs in various cities. In 1963, the uh, first Trieste uh, Festival of Science Fiction Cinema took place. And in 1972, the first European convention, Eurocon, was organized in Trieste, during which an Italia Award was also created. Speaking of awards, there is, of course, the Hugo Award, named for Hugo Gernsback. And it is the most prestigious uh, award in science fiction. Hugos were first given in 1953 at the 11th World Con and have been awarded every year since 1955. The award is uh, in given in categories which have changed over the years. As of 2019, the award is conferred in 17 categories of written and dramatic work. The 2019 awards were presented at the 27th World Con, Dublin 2019 and Irish World Con in Dublin on August 18th, 2019. The 2020 awards, rather, will be presented at the 78th World Con, Con Zealand, at, in Wellington, New Zealand, on August 1st, 2020. So if you're anywhere in the area, go to Con Zealand. Then there is the Nebula Award, and it is considered sort of the second most prestigious. It is uh, um, conferred only by science fiction authors. It annually recognizes the best works of science fiction or fantasy uh, published inside the United States. The awards are recognized and awarded by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, which is a nonprofit association of professional science fiction and fantasy writers. So the nebula is given out by uh, people who are working in the field. Uh, they were first given in 1966 at a ceremony created for the awards and are given in four categories depending on the lengths of any given literary work. Now, a fifth category for film and television uh, episode scripts was given from 1974 to 1978 and again from 2000 to 2009, but that's since been discontinued. And a sixth category for game writing was begun in 2018. The rules governing the Nebula Awards have changed several times during the awards history, most recently in 2010. And the Science Fiction Writers of America um, Nebula Conference, at which the awards are announced and presented, is held each spring in the United States, and locations vary from year to year. And that is the big old um, history lesson of how things have come to be where they are today. So, I mean, as you can see, Right from the beginning, the dissolution of the New York Futurians over what amounted to a lover's spat, science fiction fans have been bitching since the very beginning. And when literary, when that was the only science fiction available, fans bitched about that. They would uh, get into heated arguments about narrative characterization and, in particular, scientific accuracy. One particularly notable incident occurred at Worldcon in 1971. Larry Niven published the novel Ringworld in 1970. If you haven't read this book, pause this video right now, go to Amazon, get a copy and read it, and then come back, because your brain is going to love you for the rest of your life. And I have a link to it in my description box. 
Ringworld run, the Hugo, the Nebula, and the Locus Award, which is given out by a Los Angeles group. It is just that damned good. However, many fans have identified numerous engineering problems with the Ringworld, as described in the novel. One of the major ones was that the ring world, since it was a rigid structure, was not actually orbiting the star that it encircled and would eventually drift and eventually collide with the sun and disintegrate. So some MIT students who had done the math, um, they went and greeted Niven at the 1971 Worldcon with a banner reading, The Ring World is Unstable. And when they saw him, they started chanting the same thing. Niven then wrote the 1980 sequel, The Ringworld Engineers, with this instability as one of its major plot points. In terms of films, well, fans have been bitching about science fiction films since the beginning, particularly in the 1950s, as science fiction enjoyed a period of extended popularity. Um, literary science fiction fans were extremely critical. Most science fiction movies of the 1950s and 1960s were completely impossible scientifically and were completely lampooned on that basis. Only a few standouts, such as Forbidden Planet, This Island Earth, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and War of the Worlds were considered good science fiction. And it's no accident that among the many, many terrible science fiction films of that era, only these and a few others um, that are considered classics survive to this day. And frankly, if you've never seen them, um, go stream them, find a Blu-ray, because your brain is going to love you for the rest of your life. In particular, you'll find that Forbidden Planet is almost a Star Trek film, and it's just about a certainty that Gene Roddenberry drew some level of inspiration from it when he was writing Star Trek. It really wasn't until the late 1960s, particularly with the advent of 2001 A Space Odyssey, that fans began to take film science fiction seriously. In television, science fiction was lampooned by science fiction fans until the 1960s. Um, most TV was truly terrible and often aimed at children. While there were some standouts, it really wasn't until the Twilight Zone and the Outer Limits that fans began to take the medium seriously at all, and even then there was still a lot of terrible TV science fiction. But Star Trek was a turning point in TV science fiction. While it may seem quaint or even campy by today's standards, it did have a decent budget and was consistently producing good science fiction. What you always have to remember about Star Trek is they were broadcasting on crappy, analog broadcast television that was extremely low definition. Even on the best of days, at the best of times, you were never going to see a really clear picture. They never imagined that you'd be seeing it in 1080p. If they had, they'd have done it differently. But in 1080p, it looks better than what you would see if you were watching it in the dailies after it was shot. There is no way to describe just how bad it would have looked on normal, crappy, low-def broadcast analog TV. There were things and details there that you simply didn't see, and it was exactly like all the other television of that era. It took exactly the same shortcuts because you didn't see it. You could not make it out in crappy, low-def analog broadcast television. So for three years, Star Trek was truly a bright spot for TV science fiction, and uh, for fans, they generally enjoyed it. Now, this didn't stop them from criticizing anything that they thought was stupid, foolish, or unscientific, and they argued about science, Star Trek right up to this very day. <laughs> However, Star Trek fans were another um, matter entirely. For more than a decade, they were looked down upon by fans of literary science fiction. While it was a good TV show, Star Trek was still considered inferior to literary science fiction of that era, and frankly, it often was. But at general science fiction conventions, Trekkies were considered something less than real science fiction fans. I remember I was there. This ultimately led to Star Trek-specific science fiction conventions. And though it's commonly thought uh, that the earliest Star Trek convention was held in 1972, according to real die-hard Trek historians such as myself, the first one actually took place in March 1969 at the Newark Public Library. Now, the first major Star, Star Trek convention, which was called Star Trek Lives, was held in New York City in 1972 and drew 3,000 people. The next one, the next year in 1974, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that was 1972. In 1973, the next year, the convention drew 6,000 people. And in 1974, 15,000 people attended with 6,000 turned away at the door. <laughs> 
These cons, all of the ones that ran to that deer and still do, try to have the largest number of professional guests of stars. And in the early 1970s and 1980s, in the early 1980s, Star Trek conventions were run by fans, such as the aforementioned Rigel IV that I first attended. But by the end, around the time of the Star Trek Next Generation era, professional companies realized that there was a big profit to be had in Star Trek cons and began supplanting the fan-run cons. Today, there are very few fan-run conventions. However, I still find these far more enjoyable than the professionally run ones, and I attend them whenever I can. And in recent years, science fiction fans have been far more embra embracing and open, um, primarily regarding science fiction uh, on TV and films. There are also large genre-specific cons, such as Anime Central, which again is held every year in Chicago, and I've been there several times with my kids. One of my kids is a huge anime fan. Gigantic, gigantic convention. In general, lately, uh, for a number of years now, the emphasis has shifted from literary science fiction works to TV and film, which really is hardly surprising, considering the explosion of science fiction in those mediums as a result of the success of Star Wars. So, we still bitch. <laughs> Nothing has changed since the very beginnings of science fiction fandom in the 1930s. We bitch, complain, moan, and argue about virtually everything. And this is anything but toxic. In fact, bitching, complaining, moaning, and arguing is the birthright of every science fiction fan ever born. The only thing that's changed is that with the advent of the internet, it's become amplified. Rather than bitching in person or via newsletters or fanzines, we bitch in damned near real time. But it's exactly the same as it's always been, just amplified. So remember that when you get into an argument with someone about, say, Star Trek Picard, well, we're doing exactly what fans have always done. It is your birthright as a fan, and don't let anyone else tell you differently. And that's all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.